Hello, this is session three of Basics of Biblical Archaeology. Our focus in this session is going to be on a site in Egypt because it's Egypt to where the Israelites went and lived for 430 years, beginning with the moving of Jacob. The site of Avaris is located in Egypt's Nile Delta, and it's there to where Jacob moved his family in 1876 BC. So we're going to look at the Avaris of Joseph's lifetime in the Middle Kingdom in Dynasty 12. And this is going to take our attention because there's a lot that we can uh, learn and study and understand from this site that's going to connect us to the people of the Bible who were there in Egypt during the second millennium BC. Um, well, first let's um, look at um, a map, see where it's found on the map, and then let's look at um, the mound itself. So here's where Avaris is located, and, and this map basically gives us uh, northeastern Africa. So pretty much we're seeing Egypt, that's, uh, that's a part of Africa here. And then the Sinai Peninsula is here, and then off up here to the upper right is the Holy Land, the land of Israel. And, but our focus for now is going to be especially on Egypt, because the Israelites lived here under, uh, uh, after Jacob's move for 430 years. So they came down the uh, Great Trunk Road along the, um, the, what's called the Road of Horus, and, they ent and, and that dumps off at the site of Avaris. And this site is strategically positioned. It's really amazing. The site of Avaris is, is placed at the crossroads, essentially, between Africa and Asia. And there's both a land route that, that ends up going through Avaris and there, therefore through to the rest of Egypt. And then the sea route hugs the Mediterranean coast and you can take the Pelusiac branch of the Nile down uh, or actually upstream to Avaris. So ships traveled from the Mediterranean to Avaris uh, by means of this offshoot of the Nile River. And of course, as the Nile River is flowing to the north, right around modern Cairo, it breaks off and goes into a number of branches as they feed into the Mediterranean Sea. And this, of course, is why we call it the delta. The, this is the Greek letter delta. It looks like a triangle. Um, so in the no northeastern um, portion of the Nile Delta, that's where we have the site of Avaris, right here. Um, and it's located about 65 kilometers or so to the northeast of Cairo. And the site of Avaris has about 165 hectares of territory. So it's a fairly large site by ancient Near Eastern standards. In fact, it's a very large site. So this is the site uh, to where Jacob moved his family. We, we know it in the Bible as Ramses. So um, during, this, during most of the second millennium BC, Avaris served to connect Asia and Africa both by sea and land, controlling the, primar the primary flow of traffic. So all commerce came in and out of the city of Avaris. All right, um, let's talk about some of the things that relate to the site of Avaris. First of all, it's, it's strategically located because all traffic essentially from Africa to Asia went through Avaris. It didn't have to, but most of the traffic did end up going through, through there. Um, also, it's the most thoroughly excavated site in the entire ancient Near East. There's no other site that's been excavated more than this. And wouldn't you know, in God's sovereign plan, he decided that the place where Jacob settled his family and they lived for over four centuries, that would be the place that would be more thoroughly excavated than anywhere else. Excavations began there by the Egypt Exploration Fund in 1885 under a Frenchman named Henri Naville. And he did some light archaeological work there, but not a whole lot. Then... Uh, Labib Habachi um, excavated there from 1941 to 1942 for the Egyptian Antiquity Service, and he's in a, he was an Egyptian himself um, and very competent um, uh, archaeologist for his time. And he's the first one, Habachi is the first one to identify the site of Avaris um, with um, Tel El Daba, uh, the modern Arabic. Um, um, site that's, that's located there. Then in uh, 1951 to 1954, a man named Shahada Adam, another Egyptian archaeologist, he excavated at the site and found a lot more uh, important material that really prompted future excavations. In fact, um, the, 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 the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Cairo, um, in conjunction with the Austrian Academy of Sciences, 
started excavating under Manfred Bietok in 1966. And so he was the chief director from 1966 to 69 and then 1975 to 2009. Uh, and that's an in incredibly long um, service there. So he thoroughly, not thoroughly, but he, he um, significantly excavated the site of Avaris. And then he turned it over in 2009 uh, to Irene Forrester Müller. Now, um, what can be found at the site of Avaris? Essentially, uh, dynasties 12, 13, 15, 17, and 18 all are the, the time periods in Egypt's history that are represented by the, uh, what's found in the excavations there. So the 12th dynasty, that would be the, the, the first of those dynasties, that is the dynasty during which jo Jacob and Joseph lived. And so um, the, the, the move to Egypt um, is, is connected to that time in Egypt's history. And then in Dynasty 15, that's when the Hyksos took over. Those are ancient, um, uh, an ancient people from the east, from, from Asia. So they're, they're more closely related relative-wise, uh, relationally, to the Israelites than they are to the Egyptians. So there are other Asiatics who've, who, who are warring people who moved in. And then uh, Dynasty 18, that's really important because it's that dynasty that connects to Moses' life, lifetime. And we'll be talking about that more. Uh, in our next lesson. So the Hebrews lived there during all of these era, eras from Dynasty 12 through 18. And that I've argued very extensively in my book, Origins of the Hebrews, uh, New Evidence for Israelites in Egypt from Joseph to the Exodus. All right, let's now take a more zoomed in look on the site of Avaris in relation to um, where it is in the ancient Near East. And of course, we have the corner of the Mediterranean Sea up here to the right. And the, what I was telling you about, the, the road of Horus, uh, it's in brown here, and that represents the land route that ends up coming to Tel El Daba or Avaris. So you could have taken one of a number of these offshoots of the Nile and made your way back uh, upstream to the site. And this is where the site is located. Now, Avaris officially at Tel El Daba is in this area, and this area here, here is called Kantir. Kantir is the site um, that's connected with the Ramesside kings of the 13th dynasty. So the reason why, and I prove this and talk about it more extensively in my book, the reason why the Bible uses the term Ramses is because the ancient, he, uh, the ancient Egyptians themselves connected earlier ancient Avaris from from Joseph's day, they connected it with Kantir, with, with um, P. Ramesi, that's the name that, that the Ramside king, king um, Ramses II, connected to, um, um, to this location. Um, the, the Israelites understood that the Egyptians um, called P. Ramesi Avaris. So they called it two names. They called it by its modern updated name of P. Ramesi, House of Ramses. And they also called it Avaris on occasion. So for them, it's all one site. So probably a later Hebrew uh, scribe saw what would have been an earlier site name in the text, in the original biblical text, which probably was Peru Nefer, which means um, pleasant journey. And he updated it to the modern version, which is Ramses, which of course connects to uh, the Ramesside um, occupation at the site of Kantir. So here is our site of Avaris along the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. So the, the Nile River has flown, has um, uh, moved from, flowed from the, from the south northward and, one, and it, one of the branches is this Pelusiac branch and it passes right through Avaris and then it keeps going all the way to the Mediterranean. And then here's more uh, blown up view to show you some of the excavation that's been done here. So the tell itself, the highest point on the mound of Tel El Daba, is located here, and you have other heights in here, but it's much lower than the than the the tell itself. So the the main occupational areas uh, would have been all through this uh, region, um, and so the Israelites would have settled here uh, at this site. And of course, during the New Kingdom, as Bet Helmi. That's where uh, the palaces were located, where the Israelites were serving the king. And we'll talk more about that later. 
So um, area F1, this is the main excavated area that's part of Tel El Daba. So the majority of, of early Israelite history under Jacob and his family and his descendants takes place uh, in F1. At least the majority of what we know that's been excavated is right here in area F1. Um, and we also have area A4, area A1, area A2, and area AN and so forth. So there are other places where excavation was done, but the majority of the, the, the um, excavational areas applicable to the Israelites and their stay there takes place in area F1. So um, what we have here is a, several things, um, and we're going to start with the Egyptians because there were native Egyptians here at the site before the Israelites arrived, and they were mainly located in this position here. And what they did is they built a, among other things, they built a temple right here near the water, near the shore. And that temple was devoted to uh, Amenemhat I. He was the founder of the 12th dynasty. So he was commemorated by being deified. And that may sound strange to us today, but in the ancient world, it wasn't strange at all. They would take, uh, in earliest times, a deceased king, and they would elevate him to the status of a god. So he was viewed. Uh, as a god, and they built a temple to him. So that's where the, the Israelites started. And then the um, Israelites eventually, in 1876 B.C., according to biblical chronology, they moved here into area F1, and this area in black here represents the, the part, portions that were excavated, and so lots of important finds come from this very area. So that's where the, the Israelites were. And then um, uh, this... this um, area of water in here between area F1 and area R1 where the temple is, um, that became, it was eventually built into a, um, a little, um, little port. So ships would, dock, would come in and dock inside um, of this area here. Now let's look at a closer view of the area where the Israelites were living in the days of Joseph's family, including Jacob's settlement and the second Asiatic occupational phase where Joseph's sons Ephraim and Manasseh had moved to the site and were part of uh, the enclave there. So we have two areas, of course, area F1, where the Israelites settled, and then we have area R1, and this is where the uh, Egyptians were before the Israelites arrived. Uh, for example, we have this town center, and probably this represents um, Egyptian residents at the time, as well as this uh, black feature here, this rectangle uh, at, at the top of R1. So a temple was built for him or toward the, the worship of him here. And it's very important to note this, how close it is to the Plusiac branch of the Nile because that's going to come into play later. So this is the area of the important finds that we're going to look at. And this is just a little bit of a view of Tel El Daba so you can see what it's like. You can see it's fairly lush. And of course, in the Nile Delta region, they had um, much better weather uh, seasonally than they do in Upper Egypt where it's far drier, it's more arid and, and, um, and, and virtually no humidity. And that's why so many ancient papyrus manuscripts and other things can survive um, in Upper Egypt because of the lack of water, the lack of um, humidity. So here near the Mediterranean Sea, we have a, a more um, plush landscape because of both... Um, both flowing water and the, and, and the weather cycle. All right, let's look at a phasing scheme for the site of Avaris. It can be broken down into different time periods, and we talked about strata before. Each stratum represents an occupational phase when cer a certain group of people or groups of people lived at a site for a certain period of time. So our focus is going to be in this area in red, Egypt's Middle Kingdom. And as I note here, as you look at this um, chart, down at the bottom is earlier, and as you go upward, you're talking about later in time, closer to our time period as you go up. So um, especially in the, um, in the 1800s, the 19th century BC, we have, important, um, we have important occupation here by the Israelites, and that's where it begins. And they, they go all the way until about 14, 1446, so it's at this point when um, the Israelites left, they departed. So this column, so this column is the dates. This column is the Egyptian king or dynasty. And again, um, earlier 
going to later as we go up. And then area R1, where that temple was that we saw, that's this column here. So these are all the strata of area R1. And then area F1, where the Israelites are centered. That, these are all of the occupational phases here. So our focus mainly is going to be on D2. That's the occupational phase when Jacob lived at the site. And then uh, D1, which is this area in here. And that's when Ephraim and Manasseh, the two oldest sons of Joseph, were running things essentially after the death of Jacob in 1859 BC. So that's kind of a framework for what we're going to be looking at. Um, what did the site look like um, pre-phase H? And phase H is when uh, Jacob moves to the site. Um, well, we have, for example, this orthogonal grid of, um, of a native, native Egyptian settlement, and probably um, these were workers who were here to... Um, to cultivate land and to build the temple for the, uh, for the deceased uh, originator of Dynasty 12 and so forth. So there were, there were um, activities that they would have been engaged in. So this is uh, a representation of their settlement that predates the Israelites moving to Avaris. And again, um, R1 is, is an important place because it has the temple there. And inside the temple was an important inscription found that connects the Israelites to this very site. So let's move into phase H. This is known as stratum D2, according to the archaeologists. And, and I date this phase, phase H, to 1876 to 1845 B.C. or so. All right, what's going on at the site when the Israelites are there? Well, the demographics at Avaris changed late in Dynasty 12 with the native Egyptian enclave succeeded by the sudden influx of an Asiatic population that took root and eventually started to grow substantially. Now, who are these Asiatics? Of course, the excavators who are there, they can't connect the, these Asiatic people with the Israelites because if they were to, they would be kicked out of Egypt. And there's a reason for that, of course, and it's a, it's a political religious one. Um, they're, they're located in the nation of Egypt, which has Muslim uh, control. And if uh, the claim was made by the excavators there, that these were actually Israelite people, it wouldn't go so well for them. They, they wouldn't have the same welcome in Egypt that they've enjoyed all of these decades until now. So uh, the first two strata in area F1 and, and D2 and D1 um, um, were successive and associated strata. So D, again, D2 is when Jacob moves there. At the end of D2 or so, uh, Jacob dies, maybe... Um, maybe in, in this stratum, actually before the stratum is, is over, he dies and then his sons, uh, um, his adopted sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, they, they took it over. And I argue all of this in my book and you can read about that in more greater detail. Well, this is also the beginning of uh, a rural settlement, clearly dating to phase H, which coincides with, area, uh, with stratum D2 in the new center. So these are not... Uh, urban people. These are very much uh, rustic people who, who have um, more of a rural settlement. So that, uh, that was seen and understood by the excavators there at this first occupation of the Israelites, of, uh, of the, well, according to me, of the Israelites. And of course, that makes better sense because Joseph's family, the people from whom he came, um, they were um, very simple people and they were um, herdsmen. So in area F1, um, this, the previous, previously abandoned area was resettled. Phase H is documented in two other places at the site. In area A4, about 200 meters to the east of F1 are settlement layers that reach the lowest levels. And then in area A2, installations were uncovered, and these are also um, of this same occupational group of people, these Asiatics. So here they are, F1, A4 and A2, but the main one uh, with, with the finds for our purposes are in F1. And this phase um, featured small sand brick structures that were rural, rural in character, such as the round silos and walled livestock compounds. Um, Betok, the excavator there, supposed that within the core of the site at Esbet Rushdie, Egyptian administrators and Egyptian upper class continued to live. So he reasoned that an occupational overlapping at Avaris took place with native Egyptians residing at Esbet Rushdie and transplanted Asiatics living in the new center. 
And I would agree with Betok there that we have e Egyptians and Asiatic um, Israelites living at the site at the same time. So um, what are some of the finds that are there? So uh, this represents uh, a, a cemetery for area um, uh, in area F, uh, F1, but representing stratum D2 and then the later in the next stratum D1. And the green ones here are from stratum D2, and so these are smaller and more rustic. And then the larger, more complex, uh, more expensive to build tombs are in blue from area um, from um, phase, uh, phase G4, and that's uh, stratum D1. Well, here's a stella that was found there, and this is one that I discuss in my book. In fact, it's, it's I think, uh, the first accurate translation that, that's offered of this inscription, and it mentions this beautiful symbiotic relationship between the Asiatics who were there and the Egyptians who were there. It's dated right here. It says the renal year number five of this king, Senwasrit, whom we know as Sesostris, and this in this case is Sesostris III, um, who is the famine pharaoh, and I try to prove that in my book. And so that's the time period. And what it says is that there's the digging of a dike for the temple estate of Amenemkat I. And this takes place in year five uh, um, of the reign of Sesostris III. And I also try to prove in my book that Sesostris III uh, takes over the throne from his father, Sesostris II, in the very year of transition from the seven years of abundance in Egypt that the Bible describes uh, to the, the, the seven years of famine. So he takes over in year one of the, of the famine. If that's true, and we're in year five, that means we're four plus years into the famine here. So notice the timing. What happens? The digging of a dike for the temple estate of Amenemhat I. And it's, it's a digging that takes place between two people groups, the Asiatics who are here and the native Egyptians. So this is essentially the striking of a deal to build this dike. And why would you need a dike? Why would you need to connect the water to the, to the temple? Well, if you're five years or four plus years into the famine, then it makes perfect sense. And this inscription also mentions one person who's given two names and two titles. One name is Son of Sobek, and one is Horus is at the forefront, Jr. Son of Sobek, the connection there. Um, Sobek is the, is the alligator-looking god in Egypt's pantheon. And this is the God who provides for Egypt through the life-giving waters of the Nile River. So whoever this guy is, he's considered to be the son of the God who provides for Egypt through the life-giving waters of the Nile. Isn't that beautiful? And then his other name is Horus, is at the forefront, and it's essentially the equivalent of our English word junior, who's the son of Horus, is at the forefront, senior. So who is um, Horus, is at the forefront, junior? Horus is the name that's given to the Egyptian deity that's the falcon god, and, and Horus at this time in Egypt's religious um, world is the king of the gods. So the idea is that the, the king of the gods is put at the forefront by this person. And, and in the ancient world, you receive a name, not at birth, but when something distinguishes you. So this person, whoever he is, he was distinguished as putting the the king of the gods at the forefront and everything he did. He didn't put himself first. He put the king of the gods first. So in my book, I try to prove that this person is Joseph. And these are two different names given for him that describe two characteristics of Joseph. As the Egyptians looked at him, they thought of two things. They thought of, this is the guy who helped Egypt by providing for us through the life-giving waters of the Nile. So let's call him the son of this God. And he's also the son of the king of the gods, who puts the king of the gods uh, at the forefront in everything he does, which is exactly what Joseph did. When he was about to, to, to hear the dream from the king who would elevate him to second in command, um, which would be a vizier in Egypt, when, when he was about to hear the dream, Joseph said this. He said... Um, he said, it is not in me. God will give to Pharaoh a favorable answer. So what Joseph was doing was he was removing credit from himself and giving it to God before he was even elevated in Egypt. And that reflects how Joseph puts the king of the gods at the forefront 
rather than himself. He knew he was going to be elevated, that he would interpret the dreams, and he'd be elevated and honored by this king. But before he ever heard the dream, he wanted that king to know, I'm not the one who's interpreting the dream. It's not in me. I'm not able. But the king of the gods, he's able. And so he's going to give me the interpretation of the dream, and I'll give it to you. So as we look at the two important names that I'm equating with one person on the Esbet Rushdie Stella, one being Sasobek and one being Khat Jr., I think later in time these, these two names are conflated into one, which is the name Sobek Amchat, the name for Joseph. But what about the name that's on this Stella that's much earlier in his life, early in his career, in the fifth year of the famine pharaoh or four plus years into the famine? Well, his name here is Sasobek. Who is Sasobek? Well, on seal 1331, we see that Sasobek is called Iriwepet, which means he who is at the top. So it's signifying someone who's at the top of the, um, of the heap in ancient Egypt, someone who is in an extremely high position and essentially nobody above him. On seal 1340, it reads, Chati en Chefet Her, which means vizier who is in the front, and then the name Sas Sobek. And that's really important because the role of a vizier, the title of vizier in the 12th dynasty, without a question, is the highest position of anyone other than the king himself. So the vizier is second in command in all of Egypt. And the term Chati here means the shrouded one. It's kind of like with Moses and, and how he had to veil himself when um, uh, appearing before people because he, he had the, the radiance of God on him. Well, the vizier similarly was viewed as, as shrouded in mystery, and so he was called the shrouded one. So whoever Sasobek is, he's clearly second in command in all of Egypt. Then on seal 1335, it reads, and just the translation, the king's wise man, Sasobek, the Lord, the revered. Hey, there you have it, the king's wise man. You remember when uh, Joseph was presented with this um, opportunity to uh, interpret the dreams for the king? He had these two dreams that were essentially two in one. Before Joseph was, was afforded that chance, other wise men of Egypt gave their best to interpret it, but none of them could do so. But this man, Sasobek, is referred to by others as uh, the king's wise man. So clearly, he is qualitatively different than the other wise men of Egypt. Then, finally, on seal 1332, Sasobek is called great controller of the city. So Sasobek is the one who is in charge of the great city. And in the inscriptions of this time, that virtually always, if not always, refers to the capital, which was, at the time, a site called Ichtawi. This means that Sa Sobek was not just the controller at Avaris with this Asiatic population, but he was in control, he was the overseer of the capital of the entire nation. And during Dynasty 12, of course, they would be extremely strong and mighty. Now we're going to look at some of the architecture in phase H that's connected with the first Asiatic settlement here that I connect with the Israelites. So um, among the architectural features, we can see in red this building, which is clearly a four, what's called a four-room house, and it's the oldest one that's ever attested in, uh, in the ancient Near Eastern world. And, we, and this is important to us because we know that in the Israelite period, when you have kings in, in Israel and in Judah, uh, the Israelites there were mainly living in four-room houses. So that architectural feature that's, that's um, specific or unique to them is found in, um, in, in really no other place other than where Israelites were. So here it is, the first four-room house. And you can see it's based on a tripartite um, uh, architectural design, one part two parts, three parts, and they added a fourth to it. So this is almost certainly the actual house of Jacob when he first lived there. Um, and so um, this would have been the house here, the four-room house with one, two, three, four parts, and the courtyard would have been built 
around this here. So probably children or animals were, um, were running around or grazing in this area. And so this is what the archaeologists excavated that I connect uh, to Jacob's home. And so looking at some of the models that were made, these are some of the, the buildings that would have existed uh, at this time in stratum D2 in phase H when Jacob was still alive. And um, then there are important artifacts that are connected to this occupational phase. So in tomb F1, uh, zero or 019 grave number 8 that's in this, this box here um, was found a duckbill axe. So this is um, the very grave itself and this is the area where it would have been found. And here is the duckbill axe. And I actually have one here that's an authentic uh, duckbill axe to show you. This is made in, in the Levant, either in Canaan or in the northern Levant. And, and these are specific to this time period, um, what's, what's known as, in, in that area, the Middle Bronze Age 2A. And, and so um, they made duckbill axes at that time. And this, of course, is the handle. And, um, and so this, um, this same kind of uh, duckbill axe, th that axe head was found um, at this site. So it connects us with a time period. And probably what that reflects is that this would have been the axe head of most likely one of the brothers of Jacob. And it was buried with him in his tomb. And of course, in the ancient world, people were, were buried with grave goods. The things they had in life went with them into the afterlife. Um, there's a picture of this that's being held by this guy here from the tomb of Khnumhotep II at Beni Hassan. This dates to year six of Sesostris II. And of course, Sesostris II is the king who's associated with the abundance in Egypt. And you can see that he's, that he's holding it here. And I always wondered why he's holding it there until um, this axe was um, made with a modern handle for me. The, the handle is modern, it's not ancient. But you can see that the center of of uh, gravity here is at this position close to the duckbill. And that's exactly where this guy's holding it. He's holding it at that same point right there. So it's, it's very historically accurate what's depicted on this um, tomb, this wall painting at Beni Hassan. All right, now let's move to the second occupational phase. This is stratum D1. And so Jacob dies in 1859 and he's not buried there, he's taken and buried in Canaan. And what happened is Jacob gave control of the city to one of the sons of Joseph. And that, that I know from piecing together the picture found in the Bible and in the archaeological record, and I, I, I try to prove this in my book. So stratum D1 is characterized by Ephraim and Manasseh, the two oldest sons of, of Joseph. And Jacob says this, uh, he says to Joseph at the, about, about the time that he's, he's going to die, he says, Joseph, as for Ephraim and Manasseh, they are mine. Now, as for the rest of your sons, they're yours, but these two are mine. So what he was doing is he was physically removing them from their parents' home and saying they had to live among their uncles. And it's one of the most incredible strokes of genius in history because now the uncles... Um, their uncles would have the opportunity to have not, not only translators, but people who understand the culture and the customs and the way of doing things and measurements and styles and everything. Everything related to ancient Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh could help their uncles to connect the dots. So um, built over top of um, what was here, the home of Jacob, these are the two main master bedrooms in this enormous, elaborate um, um, complex of rooms that we can call, um, well, I, I've referred to it as the Egyptianized Asiatic residence. And it, essentially, it's, it's an extravagant home with room after room after room that's added on. And, it, and the two master bedrooms are built right over where the first um, four-room house was. So probably to connect Ephraim and Manasseh to their grandfather, Jacob. So they built their bedrooms right over top. And it's not cu customary at all to have two master bedrooms. Uh, and this is, again, the occupational phase where Ephraim and Manasseh moved there. It's customary to have one master bedroom. The excavators, when they first excavated here, they thought this is probably a palace. But the problem is there's no throne room. And if you have no throne room, there can't be a palace. 
that is um, a non-negotiable. So it's a residential uh, home, and it's just elaborate. It's like a mansion, essentially, with all kinds of connecting parts. And so um, in, uh, along with all of this uh, house that's built here, the Egyptianized Asiatic residence, there's one tomb that's of great importance. This is the tomb of D. Sobek M. Chat. It's known as Grave 3 or Grab 1, 2, 3, Grab 3 in German. And so this is it here. And um, if we look at this, this is with the, the, the superstructure collapsed on top. So basically the roof uh, had fallen on top of it. And so we're looking at some of the bricks from that roof. Um, so, uh, so there were people buried in here, but not only that, there were animals buried here, such as donkeys and goats. In, in total, there were, sh there were five sheep and goats and three donkeys buried. So again, this is grave goods. Um, the things that were connected with, that were part of their lives are connected with them here in death. So inside this part of the tomb, when you take away the collapsed superstructure, you look at the main chamber here, and um, that included some beautiful and amazing um, finds, including this dressed dagger that has a tang of bronze and, um, and also gold. So the, the owner of this was rich. He's called the ruler of retinue. That's his title. And retinue is the Egyptian word for the Levant. And that shows where he came from. So he's essentially the mayor of the city. And um, this also was found um, in his uh, grave goods. And this is a, a narrow-bladed axe type 1. And, and I have uh, an authentic narrow-bladed axe, type 1 axe here, so you can see the size of it, and a modern handle made with it. So this is the, the very axe that he would have carried around. And in my book, I try to demonstrate that this person who, in, who occupied this tomb, the ruler of retinue, he is Ephraim, the uh, son of Joseph who receives Jacob's birthright. So Jacob's birthright doesn't go to one of his own sons. It goes to his grandson, Ephraim. And he also left behind this beautiful, and this is my electronic drawing of, this is a beautiful amethyst scarab and a golden ring. And so basically, you know, he uses it at, to, to seal items on clay to show that he in, indeed is the one who has, you know, sent a document to someone or, or he owns something. So he used this as a seal. And here it gives uh, both his title and his name. And a little bit of it needs to be reconstructed, but... Uh, the name is D. Sobek M. Khat, um, which is clear, clearly on there. And then the title is um, Heka N. Retinue in Egyptian, and that means ruler of retinue. And that relates to work that's done in Sinai at the turquoise mines where expeditions were sent down there from Egypt. And there was a group that would go down from Avaris to be part of that. And so they would go down and, and extract turquoise for a season and then come back. And while they were there, they erected stelae that have on them inscriptions. And so there's an inscription, uh, and this is a drawing of it. This is the drawing of the, of the caption of, of the, that goes with this drawing. And it says, Sen en reka en rechenu chebededem, which means brother of the ruler of rechenu, and, and then the name chebededem. And so this man who goes down to, uh, uh, down to, to the turquoise mines at Serbit el Khadim, his name is Chebedet, and his title is brother of the ruler of Rechenu. And he's contemporaneous. They, they live at the very same time period, and that again is associated with stratum D1 at Avaris. Uh, but we know they're from the same time period, and this one is given the name Chebedet. Chebedet um, is a, an Egyptian past participle, and it's used of this man and no one else in Egypt's history that we know of this man who's riding on, on top of this donkey. And, and again, remember, with Disobek Amchat, the ruler of Rechenu, there were donkeys that were connected to his burial site. Well, this guy's sitting on a donkey, and this is his brother. It's the brother of the ruler of Rechenu. So he's probably also from Avaris. And his name, Chebedet, here's what it means, this passive participle. It means he who was disfavored. And of course, in my, my book, I go, to, go on to try to prove that this is Manasseh, the brother of Ephraim. And so the reason he's given this name is because he received disfavor 
when the birthright was given not to him as the oldest son of Joseph, but to his younger brother, Ephraim. So he was given an Egyptian name that reflected that really important moment in his lifetime where favor was taken away from him. Imagine having a name like that. He who was disfavored. That's a terrible thing. And this young boy here, his name is Shechem. And if you look up in Joshua chapter 17, there's one son of, of uh, Manasseh. And the six sons of Manasseh are named there. There's one son named Shechem. So he becomes the tent peg or the linchpin for this whole connection of uh, Egyptian figure, or figures in ancient Egypt to the people that we read about in the Bible, the patriarchs themselves. And this is the inscription where um, Shechem is named. This is a, a, a similar um, stella that's, that's erected there, a similar drawing but different writing. And so the writing on this one over the head of this young man here shows that he is Shechem. And of course, he grows with every one of the stellae that, that's uh, made in successive years of uh, performing these, um, these uh, expeditions. He would, he would appear older and older and older. And in this one, when he's much older now, he's given a name. So his name is put in, in perfect Middle Egypt, Egyptian right over his head. Shekamah, Shechem, which fits Joshua 17 too. So, um, back to Avaris, one of the finds was uh, portions or parts of a, um, uh, a statue of a person, an Asiatic person, with what we call a mushroom coifer haircut, and this is a very Asiatic design, and there were theories given as to who this person was. Here's a shoulder piece from him, and you can see some of the actual paint has survived. There are red hues here, and there are some black hues that are here. So some of the original colors are indeed visible to show that this was a multicolored look um, on his cloak. And so here is a view of um, probably what his head would have looked like painted red and his shoulder painted red and black according to the, the remnants of, of that original paint. So this is an Asiatic man and of course the question is just who he was. And you can see that that design that we saw on his shoulder blade, it matches the designs of these kilts of these uh, young men who are from Avaris. And this is on a seal that was excavated at Avaris. So there's more connection there. And you can see a shepherd's crook here to designate that this is a shepherd kind of a person who's there. And of course, the Israelites are connected with shepherding. So who is this man? Well, in my book, I try to prove that this is... Jacob, not Joseph, as others who've gone before me have, have um, mu on a much greater, to a much greater extent, kind of hypothesized based on very little evidence. But the evidence clearly connects um, uh, this statue to Jacob. And I go into great detail to discuss that in my book. And the final thing to look at is this um, Canaanite storage jar. Most of the... Um, of the pottery that's found in the, in the first occupational phase is, is um, Asiatic, but um, as time goes along, there's more and more um, e Egyptian um, ceramics that's found. But this Canaanite storage jar reflects something that's, that's true of one of the enterprises that the people here, the Asiatics, engaged in in their long time period here. And that is, they were middlemen in a wine selling industry. The wine essentially was made from vineyards in the Levant, in the northern and southern Levant. It would be crushed, uh, so the grapes would be taken off and, and crushed and then um, turned into wine. And then the wine would be um, gathered together and put in storage jars like this called Canaanite jars and then shipped um, to Avaris. And then these Israelites who were there, they would have distributed it and had this business selling wine throughout Egypt. So that is how the Israelites became wealthy in Egypt. So the site of Avaris is a beautiful example to allow us to look at one of the sites related to ancient history that not only connects us to the Bible, but helps to verify the historical accuracy of the Word of God and the events that are recorded there. Isn't that awesome? So next time we'll look at Avaris during the New Kingdom, the time period of Moses' life.